there, there are, as you said, many blacks today who are still being given totally inadequate education, yes. cannot be expected to get very far for that reason. What would be your remedy for that? Yeah, I would allow their parents to have a choice of where to send them to school, whether that choice is called a voucher scheme, open enrollment, tuition tax credit. They would put that power in the hands of their parents, mainly because that would mean that the schools would have to be responsive to them. As it is now, the school is a monopoly. They need not be responsible. If you put it in the hands of the parents, and the parents are themselves uneducated, mm -hmm and not really aware of what the various potentials are. What makes you think that they would decide more intelligently than the present system? I think, again, history. As blacks emerged from slavery, minute percentage could read or write, and yet in half a century, over half the black population was literate. So I don't think that uh, the fact that people have little education means that they are in any way uh, uh, poorer judges than distant bureaucrats who have their own access to grind and run the public school system. But in such a free enterprise exchange economy, government's primary role is to preserve the rules of the game by enforcing contracts, preventing coercion, and keeping markets free. These words were pulled from an article entitled The Role of Government in Education, written for an organization founded by Milton and Rose Friedman called edchoice.org. Their mission statement is, as the website states, EdChoice is devoted to advancing educational freedom and choice for all as a pathway to successful lives and a stronger society. Shall parents, especially those in the lower and middle income classes, have the same opportunity to choose the schools to which their children go that we in the upper and middle income classes have? That's the crucial question. And to that answer, it seems to me, you must say yes. They state that the role of government is to provide choice where choice would otherwise be impossible, like in cases of insured monopolies. In so many states, parents have little choice in how or where their children get their education, and geography can be the difference between a well-funded school and a school that is in the midst of a death spiral. But is providing a choice of school really the end-all solution to the problems facing education? Or is there something much deeper at the heart of the issue? A problem that, in our rush to provide education for all, that we overlooked? The question that I seek to answer in this essay is simple, but the answer is multifaceted and will likely return no certainties. The question is this, is it ethical for governments to decide how and what our children learn? So what is the No Child Left Behind Act? In 2001, George Bush pushed through the bill for education reform called the No Child Left Behind Act. Can a child read at grade level? And if the answer is yes, we all say great. If the answer is no, the question will be, then what are you going to do about it? It conjures images of battlefields stretching long and soldiers carrying out their wounded from the scarred, battle-torn landscapes behind them. A fitting image for a bill which some say has been responsible for the closing of many failing institutions of learning. This is our band room. Our band teacher was laid off about two years ago, and our room has been empty ever since. The bill was good intentioned, however, but the standardized testing portion of the bill is what some are targeting as the source of most of the problems. If reform is needed, the answer is not to drown the public sector and replace it with the for-profit sector. I think the danger is in the for-profit sector. The No Child Left Behind Act of 2001 has 617 sections broken out into several parts that act like chapters to a book. The result is a bill that is several hundred pages long. I want to spend a moment to talk about this bill as it is key to understanding the issues plaguing our schools. In the bill, there is a provision named SEC 9529, Prohibition on Federally Sponsored Testing. In this provision is a general prohibition that forbids the federal government from sponsoring any national tests in reading, mathematics, or any other subject unless specifically and explicitly authorized by law. The section is good intentioned, but the issue is, is that it's vague. In this section is a provision which allows Congress to pass a law allowing it. What you have now is a nationwide test, given in different forms, designed almost entirely by local government in conjunction with a monopolized testing industry, made mandatory by a severe lack of funding. There is also a subsection B which states that this law doesn't apply to international comparative assessments, and only if that assessment is administered to a small representative sample of the American population. And this is where Pearson comes in. Pearson was a publishing giant before they ever set their eyes on the American market. Out of nowhere, Pearson announced at the start of the new millennium that it had plans to buy an American testing company for the paltry sum of $2.5 billion. The very next year, the Bush administration passed the No Child Left Behind Act with overwhelming bipartisan support, 
with an 87 yay to 10 nay vote, with only three non-votes in the Senate. Seems that the need to have the American education system revamped was a tune that both parties could sing to. But fast forward to 2015 and Congress, in another wave of bipartisan support, voted to change the bill drastically. The bill stated that local governments will now have more control to dictate what should be done to improve failing schools. Since the 2001 bill passed, Pearson, now the largest testing company in America, has increased its profits from 1999 to 2001 by nearly triple from over $1 billion in revenue to over $3.5 billion. And it makes sense. As the leading scoring company in America, Pearson has market recognition. And it doesn't hurt that they also have access to lucrative contracts with local government. Some have attributed this to lobbying, but as exposed in the Politico article entitled No Profit Left Behind, Pearson used its non-profit arm of the company to pay for expensive trips and conferences, all expenses paid, including superintendents and school board members to what amounted to a fancy vacation wrapped around a sales pitch. That was until 2013 when a New York attorney general cracked down on this behavior. The charitable arm of Pearson was cut off and forced to shutter its doors when it was fined $7 million of the $10 million it made, essentially bribing public officials. In that same year, Pearson was involved with the creation of Common Core, along with the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. Common Core was controversial, even at its inception. Teacher and parent groups protested Common Core, stating that its questions were at times confusing, oddly worded, and at times just downright bizarre. Take the curious case of Pineapple Gate, for instance. There was a reading question about a pineapple who challenged a hare to a race. Now, if that wasn't odd enough, it gets worse. Now, we've all seen these kinds of test questions where the assignment is to read a short story and answer questions about the story to see if we paid attention or absorbed the message overall. The last line in the story is, the animals ate the pineapple. The question was, why did the animals eat the pineapple? The answer to which was not explicitly pointed out in the story. Up to that point, the narrator had focused on the fact that the pineapple sat still and the animals were watching to see how the pineapple would win the race. There was no hint given as to motive. The answers to the question were, A, they were hungry, B, they were excited, C, they were annoyed, or D, they wanted to be amused. Since the story was so vaguely worded, one would have to trust their own instincts. You can't ever be confident that you're right because you have to get out of the story exactly what the writer of the test question got out of it. A good quantitative question only tests you based on what's in the story. A qualitative question, like what this one should have been, is tested based on feeling and deductive reasoning. You must explain your answer so that a pair of eyeballs can determine the worth of your observation. But most standardized tests only do quantitative testing, meaning they only test what a machine can grade automatically because the testing industry has become industrialized. We're not at a point yet where a machine can grade the worth of thoughts and personal justifications. The question was so confounding that not even Ken Jennings, the most recent Jeopardy champ at the time, could come up with an answer and eventually asked if the question was a joke. Certainly someone could reason through the question and make a best guess at it. But it would be a best guess because the nature of the question is ambiguous, since the motives of the animals are never explicitly stated. NPR also reported that the news outlet that originally reported the text had reported it incorrectly, and even with the ad in language, it still provided no clear answers. Add on to this reports of New York schools failing tests and textbooks which include specific and obscure answers to questions that will appear on a test, and even though Pearson's record is less than stellar and has been proven to not be meeting federal standards, Pearson was still put in charge of Common Core, a contract worth almost $1 billion, and hundreds of millions of dollars in contracts in schools all across America. Robert, you are taking from her and from more people now heat for supporting Common Core. You're from a conservative group, which usually supports market competition. And what we saw was a progressive dumbing down. I saw in my own school in the South Bronx, not far from, from this, where, where we're sitting right now, kids who were counting on their fingers. And then suddenly they'd get the test results back and they were level three, level four, meaning they were proficient, they were above proficient. I knew as a teacher that they were not as good as the test was saying, but th th that bar just kept this getting lower George and Bush's lower. Note. In 2014, AIR, the American Institute of Research, 
filed suit against Pearson, stating that their RFP contained anti-competitive and overly restrictive, unlawful specifications. According to the Washington Post, Pearson was monitoring all social media ahead of the administration of the new PARCC Common Core test. All of this amidst a wave of opt-out parents who refused to allow their children to take the new standardized test. But if a school doesn't pass their test, they don't get funding. So how does a school pay their bills? To explain the tangled nest of laws that guide the NCLB, let's look at Title I. Title I is a $15 billion federal grant program that gives, or is supposed to give, extra money to low-income and underperforming schools. There is a complicated formula that comes along with this program, but essentially the grant gives assistance to schools which are serving low-income families in an attempt to bridge the education gap. The real problem isn't with the federal funding, it's with the school's ability to fundraise. Fundraising can be the difference between a school flushed with technology and brand new books to the school with books more than 10 years old. In poor neighborhoods where people are barely getting by, fundraising can be difficult. They would need at least the money provided by the federal government to be able to keep the school open. 